Live from Boston, Massachusetts, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering HP Big Data Conference 2015, brought to you by HP Software. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Boston, Massachusetts. This is Silicon Angle's The Cube, our flagship program, where we go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier with my host Dave Vellante. We're here in Boston live at HP's Big Data Conference, hashtag HP Big Data 2015. Join the conversation, go to crowdchat.net slash HP Big Data 2015. Ask us any questions, we're happy to answer them. Our next guest is Toby Bloom, PhD, Deputy Scientific Director, Informatics, New York Genome Center. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So tell us, I mean, obviously, when I hear that, I hear science, I hear data, which with cloud computing, and you know, we've been covering a lot of cool things around how people can get all this compute and really has moved the needle in terms of discovery. So, thoughts on that? True, where's the state of the union on this whole trend? Well, um, genomics certainly is big data. Um, we're probably nowhere near as big as Google in terms of collecting data, but I collect a fair amount. I collect about 12 terabytes of raw data a day off sequencing instruments and probably store 30 to 40 terabytes a day. Um, so there's a lot of data there. Um, and there's a lot of complexity in the analysis um, and a lot we need to do to be able to find the causes, the molecular causes of disease and hopefully cures for them and have a real impact on medicine. So what's your approach on a day-to-day -day basis? Take us, take us through the day of life um, with all this new opportunity because you have now a lot more, you're storing more and more data you certainly are ingesting your data full, as we say. You got a lot right. of data. What's going on? But How do you get to the, all the insights? How do you sort through it? I mean, does it? It's a long, complicated process. Um, what we're getting off the sequencing instruments is billions of short strings of A, C's, T's, and G's, the four letters of DNA. Um, and we do a lot of processing on that to figure out where each of those strings actually fits in, in the human genome um, and try to find the variants, the things that are different in any single person's genome from what the reference genome is. Um, and once we find those variants, the job is to figure out which ones are related to disease and which ones aren't. And for common diseases, that can be lots of variants and lots of combinations. We have a huge statistical problem. Um, there is a true answer out there, but the data is all probabilistic. Um, and so we're trying to get the best answers we can and improving the algorithms for working on it. The analytics are very complex and we do a lot to continuously improve the analytics as we work on the data. And then we're putting all of the data into one big database, an HP Vertica database actually. Um, to make it available to scientists to ask the questions they need to do the next steps in analytics. So, so what's the big go overriding goal of the organization? The overriding goal is to find the molecular basis of disease and improve health improve healthcare, um, improve medicine, um, and do that now. The Genome Center is was formed as a collaboration initially of 12 medical centers, um, and it's up to about 17 members now. Um, but we work closely with researchers at the hospitals, with clinicians at the hospitals, um, to have an impact on patient care. So, talk a little bit more about sort of what I conceptually see as your data pipeline and how that's evolved over the last you know, few years. That's a long <laughs> question. <laughs> short question, long answer. Well, okay, <laughs> short question, long answer. Um, we do, let, let me let me think for a second about what you really want to know about what we do. Yeah, so if you could there's, paint a picture a, right, of sort of how that process actually works and what's involved. So so the process itself starts from DNA in a tube, okay, and that DNA gets cut up into little pieces and sequenced on a sequencing machine after a lot of lab steps I'm skipping, okay, and then our first step is to take all those short sequences and basically pattern match them back to um, a standard genome sequence we use, a reference genome. Um, in cancer, we do that with the 
with the DNA from the tumor and then with the patient's blood and we compare them to figure out what's changed in the tumor. Um, so we're, we're matching in that case, we're not matching against a standard reference, we're actually matching against the person's own blood sample. We find all of the places, we, we, we do this big pattern matching and then when we're finished and everything's placed correctly, we figure out what the differences are. Okay, now any average person probably has one to three million differences from the reference. Um, okay. You have to make sense um, out of that. <laughs> we have to make sense out of that. A lot of that is very standard. A lot of them are common. Um, we have to figure out which ones are really related to the disease we're looking at. Um, and there's a lot of biological analysis that goes into that. Um, there's a lot of um, analytics, a lot of machine learning algorithms, a lot of statistics um, to figure out how likely it is um, that this is a true variant and not a mistake in the sequencing process. Um, and then when we get down to the, the variants that we think make sense and are most likely the drivers of the disease, um, then we need to understand the biological process that relates that to the disease, how the symptoms you see are related to that. Um, and then hopefully we can find we can find drugs that will affect the way that variant causes the disease or the progression of the disease and we can interfere with that process and find treatments. The Genome Center doesn't find the treatments, although we do do some work to figure out how to best match existing treatments for you know this to have a tumor that's being driven by this mutation, which of the drugs that are out there, um, whether they're approved for this particular disease or some so other you're kind of cancer. Things that you right, can what's bring the that best up? thing to do for this patient? Got it, okay. Um, and we do do that. And, and the process that you just described, is it a sort of a, a series of tools that you grab in the toolkit, or is it more of an integrated, sort of strict, rigorous process? Um, it's a set of tools we grab from a toolkit primarily. Um, and then we try to improve the tools in the toolkit, mm -hmm. um, but it's not one single integrated process. Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, we use any number of tools that are supposed to do the same thing and compare the results and yeah. try to figure out how to put the results together and find a better result. So it's very um, much an organic process that's constantly changing. It's, it's a constantly upgrading process. Um, the thing to remember is it's a, it's a statistical process. Um, it's, there are errors in the chemical process mm -hmm. um, that mean that there might just be errors in the DNA we're looking, results yeah. we're looking at. And there are, there are variants that occur at all points in the process. And so we're trying to, we're trying to sort, we're trying to analyze the data the best we can to be as sure as we can statistically that we have the right answer that has some truth out there, but we don't know what it is. <laughs> There's some truth, okay. which truth it's is it? Not a prob right, it's, <laughs> not a, it's not a probabilistic process in the sense of the answers are probabilistic and you get some of this, you get some heads and some tails. There's really one answer out there, we just don't know what it is. <laughs> and, and our job is to constantly improve the process. So you have to have to all the data exposed. To the, right. the data is always living then. From If that's the case, the then data is you, Yes, we keep the raw data. And if we improve the processes, we go back to the raw data. That's fascinating. I, gotta, I wanna just ask some, some personal questions around people because we always talk about these technology, people process technology, but more importantly, the younger generation. I have a 20 year old son, he's my oldest, and my youngest is 12, and there's a generation that's fascinated with this tech, from clean tech to, to some of the stuff you're working on. What advice and what would you share with folks out there who are looking to do something, they really want to apply this, whether it's physics, math, or, or stats, what, how do you advise the young kids in this generation? Because there's a real energy to work on these awesome problems and, and no, new opportunities. Well, to me, first of all, my first advice to any kid is to go with your passion. Um, but this, these are product problems that I'm passionate about. I mean, you can probably yeah, tell yeah, by just listening yeah, to awesome. me. Yeah, we are um, the idea of, of making major improvements in human health, not just in cancer, but in finding the causes of Alzheimer's disease. 
um, or diabetes or autism or, or things that cause such pain in so many people's lives, both the patients and their mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a way of approaching it now that it isn't new, but, but it's certainly power. different and it's way more powerful. Yeah. And, and so if you're interested in that, go for it. And, and, and you want to learn a lot of math and you want to learn a lot of biology. Um, you can, the math, people are going to hate me for this, but the math is probably more important than the biology. <laughs> I will hire statisticians who know nothing about genomics. Yeah, hit the books. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I can, we, we can teach them the genomics as long as we have somebody who understands the statistics and whether we're getting the right answers whether we're really going to help people and how to make that as accurate as yeah, possible. Yeah, Mike Stonebreaker yesterday was commenting on that one point. Data analyst, data science, really it's about stats. He was really harping home on statistics and being using the probabilistic mentality, whether it's, you know, theories. And the, more and, data, and the more data we have, and the more we can bring data together from the same days, from different diseases, from healthy people, the better statistics we can get. Yeah. I mean, you're living. So the more data I want. You're living a use case that, to me, I'm so passionate about because I'm not that I'm. I love health, cure health. I wish I could do more. I'm not a big math whiz, and I was okay, but I wasn't kind of PhD level. But the the Internet of Things really, you are a working use case of Internet of Things. You've got a lot of instrumentation, and we're seeing devices now on people, um, in hospitals, and in general life that now is pouring data into the system. So this is uh, really the, the future, your path is we the are, vector. We are expecting to integrate all of that data. We are expecting to take data streaming off devices, and we're expecting to take clinical data and medical records, and eventually be able to integrate that with all the genomic data. It's essential, especially for these yeah. very common complex diseases to have all of that data. And you were saying you want more data, you just and said that. And I want that. more and data. This morning we heard more data means more complexity. It doesn't necessarily mean better answers, so uh, what are your thoughts on that and how do you address that challenge? From my point of view, more data used correctly means better answers. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and it means better health. Yeah, and, and Moore's Law um, and or with cloud computing, compute is getting more abundant, so the supercomputer capabilities can be on the, on the, on the top of a I'm, pin. I'm not worried about getting, uh, we will get enough compute if we can get enough <laughs> data. Um, but, but really, yeah. lots of different kinds of data that we weren't thinking of integrating before. Um, we have one project now, a rheumatoid arthritis project, where we actually are putting apps on people's smartphones. Because we want to know if there's a change. Rheumatoid arthritis spikes every mm -hmm. once in a while. And between it, much fewer symptoms. And we want to know if we can tell by looking at RNA data when the spike is going to happen before it happens. But if we can correlate those spikes, that will help us figure out the mechanism of disease and how autoimmune diseases work. But if we can correlate that with patient movement changes before the spike, we can tell them to go to the doctor faster and get the drugs they need to contain this, this yeah. flare before it happens. Yeah, I mean, other thing I want to bring up is obviously crowdsourcing is a big part of the world now. You see Kickstarter, we got the crowd check going on. A lot of interactions now. We're a network society, we're connected. Yes. And everything can be instrumented, including potentially our brains at some point apparently an embedded chip there. How do you talk to people who might be afraid? I mean, I was just talking with my family members about 23andMe that I signed up for. I want the data, I'm a curious person. Now I'm a little bit, you know, take that risk, but they were nervous. How do, I, how do you get people to embrace this idea that if we collect more data and participate, it's at better outcomes for everyone? So I think everybody has family members who are affected by some illness. Mm -hmm. whether it's cancer or cardiovascular disease or somebody they know with ALS or somebody they know with a child with autism. Um, to solve those problems, to find medical answers to those diseases, we need everybody's genomes. And you're helping yourself and your family and what that might happen in the future, and you're helping everybody else at the same time. Um, and there are privacy issues, there are some risks, and we should all learn about them, yeah. but for the most part, yeah. donating your genome to medical research is not a big risk. Yeah. 
Um, There's a lot of an anonymized data, and it's pretty much, it's not, no one's gonna come in and say, well, you know. Well, the, the thing to understand is that your genome is like a fingerprint. It's yours alone, and it's unique to you. If you have something to compare it to, you can be re-identified. If you don't have anything to compare it to, you don't. But people use fingerprints all the time to, to find people. Well. So, and, and so we don't know, right? Um, so do you have thoughts on, on public policy and how that should be shaped to affect better outcomes? Um, I can give you personal opinions. Yeah, we love personal opinions. Um, okay, <laughs> personal <laughs> opinions, not to be associated with the New York <laughs> Genome Center. The first thing I would like to see is GINA, which is the genome, it's, it's the law that protects people from discrimination in jobs and in medical care based on their genomic data. Okay, it is limited to those two areas. I would like to see it expanded so that if people donate their genomes, they can't be discriminated against in life insurance or disability insurance or um, long-term care insurance, and not just them, but their families, right? Um, so for me, you know, I'm, I don't know, I actually have not had my whole genome sequenced yet. Although I certainly would if I was sick now, and I will soon anyway. How do you do it's that? Now it's possible. What's, what's 23andMe? That's not genome. That's just 23andMe is not a whole genome. It's a number of genes. So in I the submitted genome. my DNA via and you've gotten kit. some right, and you've gotten some results back. There's yeah. other information. I've been waiting until I can do my whole genome because I want all of the information. Genes only make up about 1% of the genome. How do you do a genome? Do you like walk down to the local genome store and like, is it only New York? I mean, I mean, is there places, um, is there facilities for that? Um, or is it special? I don't, okay, so the New York Genome Center has received approval to sequence anybody who volunteers to give their genome to medical research but we don't have the money to pay for it, so we're asking people to donate their genomes and pay for the sequencing. Um, and so, yes, we are how capable much, of doing roughly? that. How, what? How much does it cost? About two thousand dollars right okay, now. Okay, so the uptake on the general consumer market. So the uptake is not. Is not I got to buy be an there. iWatch. You should get a genome. <laughs> if I get, <laughs> you know, with the with the Precision Medicine Initiative, yes. we're going to be able to do, we hope, a large number of those without cost to the yeah, to yeah. the individual. Um, but it's not cheap to do yet. Yeah, I can understand um, that. And we'd like that information. There are projects that are disease specific where we have the funding to do yeah, it. Got it. So okay. not, not, not very long ago, um, decade, maybe even less, you had a lot less data, it was much more expensive to process, uh, you had to do a lot of sampling. Uh, how has this ability to manage or analyze this data deluge affected Medicine. Can you give us some examples or some some, some hopeful signs? Um, there's there's certainly hopeful signs there. Mm -hmm. um, there is now a drug for some some percentage of cystic fibrosis patients that helps them live a normal life. I mean, there's a lot of kids out there who would been have been unlikely to live past the age of 20 or so mm -hmm. who are going to be okay. Um, because of genomics. Um, there's, um, there's any number of cancer drugs that have been developed based on genomics and a, and a paired diagnostic that says, if you have this mutation, this drug will work. Um, there's, so, so, and then there's, there's lots of anecdotes in the market. And, and my understanding is in the case of, of cancer that, uh, and I, I my inference is that data has played a role in this, is that the way in which cancer is treated is the thinking on that is changing. That's supposed to it used to be sort of let's I brute force think, cure cancer versus like HIV. Let's see right. if we can live I think, with this disease. I think there are a lot of cancer centers now who are thinking that they really should sequence every patient who comes through the door. Um, we're doing a study right now mm -hmm. on glioblastoma, which is a very aggressive brain cancer. Most patients don't live more than 12 to 14 months after diagnosis. We're doing a study to do whole genome sequencing on their tumors and on their blood and, and comparing. 
um, and some RNA sequencing and trying to figure out for each individual patient what drugs out there are most likely to have the, the best effect on these particular sets of mutations and figuring out if there are combinations of drugs that we can recommend. Um, this is under, this is a research project. Um, it's not a, it's, it's not, you know, all of their physicians are enrolled in this project. We just go back to their, we go to a tumor board to get our recommendations approved, and then we go to their physician and say, this is what we'd recommend. It's up to you and the patient to decide whether to take this chance so or I, not. I got to so ask, wait, wait, so I'm sorry, we're, so we're starting to see effects, but your community must be very excited about the potential we're, decade, we're, two decades, three decades. We're very road. excited, and hopefully, hopefully within the decade, we're going to see major progress. You've seen drugs for melanoma yeah. that have amazing yeah. effects. Right. right now, that those effects often don't last all that long, but you need more data. They, they do, yeah. but right. So, so there are a lot of people who will tell you that cancer is going to become a chronic disease before it gets cured. Mm -hmm. Right? We'll go from mm -hmm. one drug to another drug to another drug. Um, I'm not a biologist or a physician, and probably not capable of making that. <laughs> you get the math side. Answer yeah. myself. Uh, I got. I got to ask. We got two minutes left. I want to ask. How do people get involved? Because I mean, it seems like a no-brainer to me that there'd be support for this. You see the ice bucket challenge is coming back for a second year. Boatloads yes. of money are being raised. Some are always questioning where it goes. How do people get involved? Why is it taking so long? Why is it taking so long for people to kind of come to this, th their senses on this? And two, what can people do to get involved? Uh, share some information on that. Hard question. Okay. Um, we are starting to do some projects where we're crowdsourcing and asking people to volunteer without having to pay. Yeah. to at least do some genomic work on a large on large populations. New York's a very diverse city and just mm. having a Uber has more data than, than you guys. That's ridiculous. It should be the other way around. Uber can't possibly have more data than me. Oh. Can they really? Well, they rewrite them. No, I won't get okay. into that. That's confidential rate, information. Um, <laughs> the other thing that I think is holding things back right now are regulations. Um, and. I very much believe we do need regulations around this and we need to protect patients. I think some of the regulations were written 10 and 20 and 30 years ago, at, before the internet, um, before genomic medicine, before the notions of privacy and what was important and what wasn't to keep private changed. And so there are lots of limitations mm -hmm. on policy. how much on how much right. There's policies about what yeah. data I can combine and what data I can't combine, yeah. and who can see the data I have and who can't see the data I have. And I think when it gets easier to say, we just want to consent patients to use their data for all medical research, um, and we have some way of getting at the data we already have to use for all medical research, it will make it much easier to have an effect. So you have a policy challenge, and you have funding, are really the two things, right? That yes. are driving, that you're balancing. Yes, that's, and funding, and, and we're hoping the funding will come, but yes. And so what should people do? If you had to you know, share folks who are watching, how can someone who really wants to change, because Silicon Valley, where I live, everyone wants to change the world, building apps to, to, to uh, ship food to someone's house, or to hail a cab, or to do ad technology serve better ads, to, but make the world a better place. What can people do? Well, well, if you're talking about <laughs> Silicon Valley, you can certainly ask people to donate money to, to do genomic studies on the disease they care about most. Yeah. Um, I know Sergey Brin and, is and passionate they about should, this topic. And, and they should donate their genomes to research. Yeah. Um, and, I don't, I don't know exactly how else I want to tell people to get involved. We'll shout Learn out. Learn the get math involved. and become computational biologists and help us deal with all the data. I think that there's a post 9-11 generation out there that's, that really is different than the generation before, which is they really want clean energy, you have electronic cars, a lot of really good science going on right now. Help us, help us do the science. We need more people doing the science. I desperately need people doing the science. Toby, thanks so much for spending some time with us. It's an amazing conversation, super important, and you know, really geeky, but also changes the world as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, and thank you for We're having me. Live in Boston, nice. this is theCUBE, uh, sharing our genome with you. It's all about the data, more and more data. We'll be right back after this short break.